I almost dropped out multiple times. I was earning about 1600 bucks a month and I was literally living below the poverty line. I couldn't afford gas. What's the story behind the YouTube channel? And I ended up in the ER. I turned to my wife and I said, I can't do this anymore. You just build this rapport with the adjuster and then when they turn your back, you just add a foot onto everything. Why couldn't you help yourself? That my morning commute was an hour and 45 minutes. Why people fail at roofing sales? I let everything go. My health, my relationships. I'm gonna get chewed up spit out. If I sell one roof, I'm going to earn more than I would in a whole month. And if you don't have clarity and direction, guaranteed you're going to fail. Today I have a very special guest for you, Adam, the roof strategist. You have no idea how short this guy is. I mean, if you see a person online, you just don't know. You, you, like, there's no way to know the height of the person. If, if, this, if this guy would show up at my door, I would be like, kid, who are you? If I'm sitting next to you on the airplane, how do you introduce yourself? You're a YouTuber, coach, yeah. sales, roofing? Like yeah, that's a good question. I say that I have a business helping roofing sales professionals smash their income goals. That's so, what you tell me yeah. on the airplane. Yeah, that's my, that's my, <laughs> my airplane. Because why would we have a conversation otherwise? If you're interested, you're going to ask me a question. Sure. And then I'll share more about how that happens. But most people, when they ask that question, they don't care. You know, if you work at the DMV and I say, what do you do? You're going to be like, well, I help people register their vehicles. You're like, I work at the DMV. You know, mm -hmm. so that's who I help. I help roofing sales professionals smash their income goals. What's your story? Give me your background. Oh, man. So I, um, I did, school wasn't something I was super interested in, but I grew up in an area just like people went to college. So um, I ended up choosing a school that was the least traditional as possible. Um, the furthest thing from school school could get. And I got a, an undergraduate degree in psychology. I almost dropped out multiple times, didn't. And then um, started getting interested in natural medicine. I really loved how the human body works and responds to, to nature and healing. And I went down alongside my undergraduate degree studying these different forms of natural medicine. And after my undergraduate degree, I continued schooling and I, I became a, an instructor of a few different modalities started a practice and I was broke. Um, I had a, a friend of mine bail on his lease six weeks in and we were living in New Mexico at the time. Um, I moved to Madison, Wisconsin to be near my brother because my niece was being born. And I got a job at one of the worst <laughs> massage therapy franchises available. And I was earning about 1600 bucks a month, uh, required to be on site and only got paid if I was booked. They paid you garbage, not everyone tipped. And I was literally living below the poverty line. So I was living on like $4 and 20 cents a day in groceries. I didn't even go out for a Subway sandwich. And it reached this point where um, my family is, was two hours away in Illinois and it was Easter. And um, I couldn't afford gas. I literally could not afford to drive my truck to go see my family. And I was in my early twenties. So I had to uh, call my mom and I said, is there any way that you can send me, this was over the banking app, 20 bucks, just so I can get in to see family. She said yes, and it was the most demoralizing and demasculating moment of my life. So I took her up on it, and on that drive-in is what set me here. Um, I called her up. I said, I, "I thank you, but I can't do. I can't live like this." You know, everyone's like, "Chase your passion," and and I realize there's a difference between the doing of your passion and then finding a a, a vessel to exercise your passion. Meaning, like, if you love working with people. So many people reach out, oh, I love talking to people. It doesn't mean you have to be in this field. You can find, you can teach, you can instruct, you can be in sales. So um, I found that that was kind of a, like a, a false hope that people say, follow your passion and great things happen. So what I ended up doing is, is talking with my mother and my stepdad was in the roofing business years ago, high-end metal retail. They work some storms. He says, hey, you can make a hundred grand selling roofs door to door. I didn't believe him. I was like, no, you can't. That's doctor money. You don't, you don't do that. I literally had nothing to lose. So I jumped in, um, at home that night I got back, I jumped on Craigslist and I started looking for, this was in 2011, started looking for, uh, jobs for a roofing company just to see. And as you know, if you're half competent, you're going to get interviews. So I got interviews and, and, um, showed up to chat with these folks. And I'm like, wow, this industry already, I could tell wasn't very traditional. And I knew that 
some people shared just some incredibly unethical things they were doing in their business practice that they share with me at the interview. I was like, oh my gosh. So this one company says to me, hey, this is all about making money. And what we do, this is paraphrased because it was over a decade ago, that um, when you're measuring the roof, this was before everyone eagle viewed, hand measuring things. And, and uh, if, if you're doing it through the adjuster, you just build this rapport with the adjuster. And then when they turn your back, you just add a foot onto everything and you pump up the, the measurements so you can earn more. So they're starting to share this stuff with me. And I was like, clearly, like, I wasn't, you know, I, I had no interest in participating in this. And the company that I ended up with, I never left until I left, left. Um, operated with integrity. I absolutely loved the owner. He was great. And I knew that, I just felt like he actually took care of his people. He was always willing to do the right thing, which never changed. And, and I just said, hey, I'm going in. I'm, I'm going to give this a shot. And my training was in a room just like this. And it lasted uh, shorter than how long we've been talking. Here's a sample board. Here's this. Get on a roof. I didn't have a ladder. I didn't know how to climb a ladder. I didn't know how to set a ladder up. I didn't know what to look for. It was here's three tab. Here's this. Here's a contingency. Go do it. And it was, I was eight weeks late on a storm. I didn't even know a hailstorm hit in this area. So that's how I fell in. Uh, I'm sure I can share more. I mean, I could go on. I don't want to bore the details. Um, so I, from taking that leap, right, trying to juggle this massage therapy thing on, on the side, even though it was my primary source of income, but I was having to do massage on uh, weekends and evenings, which is prime selling time. And I quickly did the math. My average commission would be $1,000 to $2,000 at that time. And um, I, I was like, man, if I sell one roof, I'm going to earn more than I would in a whole month of doing this massage thing. So I, I had two grand in my name. And my rent and utilities was about $1,600. $1,200, I'm sorry, 1200 or so. And um, I needed to make it happen. I just There was no choice. So everyone that loved me was like, wait, it's commission only. What are you doing? You have no experience. Why are you doing this? And, and I said, because I have, I have literally nothing to lose. Like, you know, what's going to happen? Who cares? Um, I wasn't married. I didn't have any children. So there was nothing, no, no, nothing. How fast you started making money? It took me eight weeks. Eight weeks? Yeah, eight Real weeks. Real money started coming in? Real money. Yeah, my first job was a commercial sale. It was a small commercial sale. The commission wasn't a commercial sale. I made like 2200 bucks. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. But I was, I got my teeth kicked in over and over. I didn't even know where to go. No one gave me a hell map. There was a, was a new office and the manager wasn't always there. So um, yeah, my first sale was a cold call off a of for rent sign, leaving the gym. I was, I was burning out and I was in the gym over lunch powerlifting training for a powerlifting meet. And I left and someone last week actually recognized that story from Madison. It's like, oh, you're leaving Ford's gym? I was like, yeah. So anyway, I was leaving Ford's gym and, I, and the building next door was it just beat up. For, and never tried this pitch, just called up, said, hey, is this the owner or manager? I'm calling about that vacancy. He says, yeah. I said, hey, the roof looks like it's in pretty bad shape. He goes, yeah, it's leaking. I said, listen, I might be able to get you a new roof if we can find enough hail damage up there from that recent storm. Would you like me to come take a look? And I wouldn't run into that exact phrase now, but uh, he said, sure. So I hopped up there, got the contingency signed, got the roof approved. The adjuster fell through the roof that day, by the way, I caught him. Yeah. And, um, and that was the first roof I put on. And I have a heck of an embarrassing story about that first experience too that might be entertaining for some people. Let's do it. Share the story. We'll have stories here. So first, this first commercial sale, um, I told this at a meet and greet I did in uh, Houston for the first time. I, I show up. My manager was too busy to train me on how to do a work order because we were running things start to finish at that point. Um, so I just show up and the crew, Latin crew, comes up. They say, Adam. We have no plastic cops. We have no plastic cops. So I'm the new guy. I'm like, plastic cops? I don't know what plastic cops are. So I'm like, what do I do? He's like, just go to ABC. Give me some plastic cops. We can't start till we have plastic cops. So I jump in my truck. I go to ABC. I walk up to the counter. I'm like, hey guys, I need some plastic cops. The guy looks around. He's like, what? I'm like, I need some plastic cops. And he finally figures it out. So of course he brings the other guys over to like make me feel like a total fool. And he's like, tell him what you need. I'm like, I need some plastic cops. It's like, Okay, we got, you. we got some plastic cops for you. Uh, how many? And I was like, I don't know, like 40? <laughs> By the way, it was a 90 square job and uh, small commercial property. So then he goes, just so you know, it's plastic caps. So I drive around, the, the guys in the, in the supply house are cracking up, loading me up. And it was the cardboard boxes, you know, the ones that the minute it rains, they just dump plastic caps everywhere. So I pull up on the job site. I'm just totally humiliated and beat down and, and, and 
you know, luckily the guys had a good sense of humor because I had 40 boxes. And uh, it, was, it was just a good, a good lesson for people to learn. Like, and I know you bring this up a lot on the channel about product knowledge. You know, it's important. It'll come. I didn't know anything. You know, and you start making money with no product knowledge, with no sales training. No sales training. I, I was completely self-taught. Self, uh, fast forward um, to the times where you started teaching others. Why yeah. did you start teach others? Why did you, when did you become so confident that you can share with others? And yeah. what changed? What kind of sales training did you got along the way? Yeah, very, very good question. So fast forward, worked my way up to chief operating officer of the company, and I was working on our sales systems and, and processes. And that was just the beginning. And the reason I ended up on this side was at first I burned out. We had offices in Wisconsin, in Montana, in Indiana, in um, Illinois, Ohio. I was very, that was a kind of a, a dormant office at that point. But I got so busy, like we, I was flying to get our Mo Montana office set up and flying back home. And I got so busy I couldn't drive. So I had a truck there, a truck here. I was working a hailstorm in our backyard. And right after I bought a house with my now wife, um, I was living in a house with eight guys I managed. And I was working pretty much seven days a week, traveling, flying, eating like garbage. I let, I, I let everything go, my health, my relationships. And uh, I ended up driving up to our corporate office because I helped organize the structure that we could run out of one corporate location as opposed to it, which is standard operating these days. But this was a revolutionary um, concept back then of finding ways to, to run companies remote. So I kind of screwed myself because I had an office a mile from my house, but our corporate office was an, an hour and 45 minute drive one way. So I was doing that every day. And um, I was on the way up there and I had this chest pain. I, I almost pulled over and called 911 because I thought I was having a heart attack. And I ended up in the ER. I pulled in to our office. I asked, uh, our, our manager's name is Wyatt. So you got to bring me into the ER. I think I'm having a heart attack. I wasn't even 30. Luckily, I wasn't, but I did have a rare um, chest infection around, it's called pericarditis, this infl inflammation in the area around the heart. And, and they don't really know what causes it. It's viral, but they go, are you under some stress? And I was like, am I, do you have time, honey? Like, sit down, let's talk about it. And, and that was the, the time that the seed was planted. And um, I realized that through this industry, I had chased my goals. And I had chased them so much that I had neglected everything else that's important. So it was when I was sitting on the beach on my honeymoon, finally, I took, two, I had, took a two week honeymoon. And it was the first like long vacation I had taken in, in a matter of years. Um, I turned to my wife and I said, I can't do this anymore. It's not worth it. You know, I was on track for life changing money. And here I am in my 20s. I had a toy Mercedes. I had an F, a new F-150, an ATV, a boat, just paid cash for a kitchen remodel. I remember driving home one day and I'm like, I'm, I'm unhappy. I can't do this. So I, that's when I, I had a really hard conversation with, with the owner. Um, who was one of the most influential people in my life. And I said, I just can't do this anymore. And I had left to go start a, a personal development company to teach people how to set goals and achieve things in a way that will actually bring full fulfillment with all these key areas aligned, which by the way, is part of one of my programs now. Why, why couldn't you help yourself? You know, that's a really good question. And I don't know the answer to that. At that point, I was so burned. I'd gained 30 pounds. It was to the point that I just, I didn't know if there was a path to living the life I wanted to live in that place. I had put myself in a place that my morning commute was an hour and 45 minutes. So I either needed to make a choice, just one way in the morning to go up to our office. And then I was floating the state and then flying out and driving to Indianapolis and driving to Chicago. And that I either needed to commit to that lifestyle or commit to moving up to our corporate office, which I just, from a lifestyle standpoint, didn't want to do. And um, my absolute passion wasn't the operations. It wasn't putting out fires. I handle all of our marketing and legal affairs and, and operational things. And my passion was helping the sales reps in this industry, the guys that I was in their shoes and knew what it was like to fall into this business and want to change their lives and, and earn a good living and create opportunities. That was my passion. And, and that's what led me to this side as people refer it to. What brought you to that side? So. Um, when I left, I ended up um, working with Jim Johnson, who you've had on the channel. It was Roof Coach Pro at the time. And uh, Jim was great. I'd hired him for our business. So we, we coached together and we amicably split ways. 
and I just really wanted to focus on 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 sales people, um, which evolved into this whole thing, which is a story in and of itself. So, how would you uh, compare roofing sales to other sales in other industries? Complexity of the job is it easier? Earning potential and stuff like that. Very good question. So, how this compares to other industries? Uh, a lot of overlap and a lot of a lot of things that are very unique. And I took a break from roofing sales for a couple years. It's a story for another time. Maybe we'll get to it. And I've, I worked with companies that had a similar sales cycle as roofers, meaning get someone to express interest, do a consultative sales process in person, high ticket sales, expensive, and get people to from here I'm interested to I want to work with you. And there is a lot of overlap, but the difference is like a lot, this industry attracts people from all types of sales backgrounds. A lot of guys from car sales, and, it, and that part is so different. The biggest difference is whether the need is established or not. Mm -hmm. When we're going door to door, the hardest obstacle we're facing is establishing a need. A need, well first to start a conversation, but then to establish the need to do an inspection or to get a roof. Whereas when you're in car sales, I can walk into the dealership and I'm basically saying, I'm here, I wanna buy a Ford, Volkswagen, whatever it is, show me around. And you, uh, you've, you've bypassed that entire process. But in terms of other sales, the fundamentals don't change. It's a very different, any in-person sale and any high ticket sale, there's the same steps to follow to get from point A to point B. Um, but there is obviously the, the industry specific and, and process specific information is very unique to our industry. And that's what lengthened my learning curve is you can study up all the sales material in the world, <laughs> but it doesn't all directly translate to our start to finish process and the product and the process. And when I say process, I mean whether it's retail or storm. What's the story behind YouTube channel? How did you get on YouTube? Yeah. How, how did it change your life? Yeah, how did I get on YouTube and how did it change my life? It was all on accident. I started the Roof Strategist brand. Um, my wife and I, after this burnout phase, shortly after I burned out, um, my, my best friend's father uh, took his own life and he was like family to me. This shattered my world. And it really made me realize we're not guaranteed a retirement. Everyone has this mindset, grind it out, enjoy it later. I call BS on that. You know, If you can't enjoy life while you're doing it, no one's guaranteeing that you're gonna wake up tomorrow. And then um, my wife's cousin in his 40s diagnosed with esophageal cancer and was gone. And both of that was like, wow, like we got to make a change. So when I was working with Jim, I'd sold my house. We bought a fifth wheel RV. We traveled the country. And uh, that's when this brand started. When Jim and I decided to, to part ways, um, I, I started this brand for the sole purpose of working with companies one on one to help scale their sales process period. So I worked mostly with management and it wasn't cheap. It was a few grand a month and they got one meeting a week and we, we, we met and then we'd implement. And I said, man, I really want to touch more salespeople's lives. That's where I really have fun. Um, the process stuff doesn't excite me that much. So I started making a couple of videos for my clients, salespeople. I said, hey, just share this with your team. So I started making a couple of videos and um, I, I put them up on my website and I had to log in. It was just unlisted on YouTube. And then when I decided to take a break from the roofing industry, it put a bad taste in my mouth because of the bad apples. I didn't want to be associated with it. I had a client that was doing some things that I later found out was just, I didn't agree with. And, and I took a break and I wanted, I loved the, the sales side. So I became a direct response copywriter. I worked with some quasi celebrities and moved some mountains on that front. And when I made that move and where I worked with lawyers and attorneys and membership organizations, people that had that similar sales process, I just said, I'm going to make my videos free. I'm just going to put them up on the channel. I hope they help someone because this industry did a lot for me. And I expected either nothing to happen or people to make fun of me. You know, the first thing you open up, this guy's short. I've gotten that my whole life. People are like, hey, look at this nice guy I met. It's like, I am, I am abnormally short by certain standards, right? Norms of, of that, these things. And, and I knew that a lot of the industry at that point was hard sales, hard sales, hard sales. I'm like, I'm gonna get chewed up, spit out. So little did I know, it sat there, nothing happened. Then all of a sudden the video started picking up and people started saying, make more videos, make more videos, these are really helpful. I was like, okay. So I just started to kick the tires. This was in 2015 is when the channel started. And I, and I just started to make a few more videos. And then I said, you know what? 
I could do something. I could give people more. So I took some of the material that I developed for myself and I packaged it up as my first product to be able to provide to people. I said, I'm going to do some things no one's ever done. I'm going to give away all the training. But what I'm, going to, what I'm going to provide for those that are interested are the materials and the strategies I used. Because right now, the salespeople, they're at the most disadvantage in the entire industry. They're at the liberty of their company and everyone in the industry, and it's no fault. We're all in this, you know, everyone's got to make a living, is charging a premium. It's like the wedding industry. So it's out of reach for a salesperson. And I wanted to find a way to help that guy or gal in the industry. And um, that's what started the whole channel. And then as it began to pick up, I don't know what happened. It just started sort of accelerated. The internet works in strange ways. YouTube, the algorithm, no one ever truly knows how it works, right? We all have our ideas of it. And, and that's what led to, led to the channel and strengthening my, my vision, my mission, and my journey in, in the industry. So it was all by accident and by request. And since day one, uh, Marcus Sheridan, they ask you answer. I, I cannot wait to meet him at Roofing Process he inspired the direction of this channel. People have questions, I help as best I can. Don't sell. Well, yeah. would you recommend salespeople to start YouTube channels and for personal brand to, I don't yeah. know, educate consumers? It's a good question. I don't know if YouTube would be the best platform for them. Um, the reason for that without, I, I think a personal brand is huge. I've seen guys having a lot of success with TikTok and Instagram and Facebook. Those have social elements of sharing and interaction in a different way than YouTube. I don't know if an individual sales rep would, would be spending their time incredibly wisely on a YouTube channel because it's not as localized and there's not that level of interaction and ease of generating leads. I do think video is incredibly important for them to be doing, but I don't know if YouTube would be the best platform for it. Why people fail at roofing sales? Uh, a few reasons. First, wrong fit. Second, they quit too soon. Wrong fit, like it's not for everyone. It's not. For, it is absolutely not for everybody. You know. Do you have like a test um, to find out if it's for you or you, yeah. you, you're you're fit for the industry? Five profile traits: hustler, thick-skinned, persuasive, persistent, and confident. The interview process I I teach is to um, ask historical questions. If I said, "Hey, Dimitri, how would you handle it if I did this?" You're a smart guy, and everybody interviews well. You're going to tell me the answer I want to hear. So when I can ask, hey, Dimitri, tell me about a time where you had a customer yelling at you. You're gonna go, all right, oh yeah, okay. So this one time, and then when people tell you a story, they're truthful. Mm -hmm. There's much less likelihood of them spouting BS. So all I do in my interview is I write down those words, hustler, thick skin, persuasive, persistent, and confident. What I mean by hustler, by the way, is not like hustle, grind, knock every door. I mean someone that has exemplified the fact that they are willing to put in the sweat equity to achieve a goal. Athletes, um, people that are chasing goals. It could be athletics, it could be volunteer work, whatever. Thick skinned, you know, being able to rub someone. If, if someone cripples under a little bit of, of discomfort, they're not gonna make it. Persuasive, I wanted them to have some level of, even if they don't have traditional sales training, they need to be able to um, get you to see their viewpoint. All right, that's how I define it. Persistent. No doesn't always mean no. I want to see folks that can wake up, challenge themselves, not have any progress, and still continue. It's the people that'll try, I knocked doors for two days, it didn't work, I'm going to go to the next neighborhood. No, man. You know, that's not how it works. Or people, I, I did this one time, it didn't work. That's not enough. You have to be persistent. And then the last one is confidence. If I have someone come in for an interview and they're doing this and looking away from you and they can't keep eye contact or they shake your hand with the like limp wrist, get out like i'm not gonna as a sales coach yeah. how do you tell someone that they're not fit and don't even try we have a guts to tell person like you're not a fit man don't try go get a job at mcdonald's um you know that's a good question and there are there there is a reason to do that i have said to people the last person i hired by the way before i left is still at the company she, her she wasn't in sales, she was in a relationship development role. But I told her, I said, your number one, con my number one concern with you is that you don't have the public speaking skills to be able to stand in front of a group and facilitate these processes from this networking and relationship building. And, and I said, are, what are you willing to do to, to develop that skill? Because this is make or break for me. And she based, she just jumped into the opportunity. I love learning. I, and I put her in Toastmasters and she went into it. 
And it was really cool. So yes, I've said that to people. And in that interview with those five traits, I'm literally checking off yes or no. I don't even tell them about the job till I have an answer. Do they have all five? If so, move into selling them on the position, telling them about it. And then if not, I'm just gonna end the interview and say, hey, you know, thanks for coming in. I really wanted to get to know you. And it just doesn't seem like you're a good fit for this. And if some guy jumps back and is like, why not? I'll be honest with him. That feedback's gonna help, it's not easy to do. And I didn't always do that, by the way. What I teach, I didn't know all this stuff from day one. There's a lot I learned in roofing. There's a lot I learned after roofing. And there's a lot more I've learned now. And I don't know it all. In every training I run, everyone I talk to, I'm always learning from people. You mentioned Marcus Sheridan. Who else do you follow? Marcus Sheridan, Brendan Bruchard, Brian Tracy, Gary Keller. Uh, let me see if there's any others that jump out. Those are the most, probably the most influential that I've, uh, authors that I've, books, that I've read. Their books, yeah. Oh yeah, video. let me, so Marcus Sheridan, they ask you answer. Uh, absolutely. Coming to roofing process. Yeah, process. coming, I, I just, I can't, I cannot wait to meet him. He's amazing. Um, I got to meet Brian Tracy. I wrote Brian Tracy a letter after I made my first six figures and I was like, thank you. I, I can't even thank you. Like, and he actually, him or someone on his team responded at either rate, made me feel great. Um, I've read every single thing Brian Tracy has ever written. Um, starting with the book Goals, um, Br uh, Brent Bruchard, High Performance Habits, life-changing book. I actually only finished that recently at the recommendation of, of Josh. Josh, thank you, a uh, client of mine. And then um, Gary Keller, the book, The One Thing. That was, that was absolutely instrumental in, in just achievement because I found that it, without direction, everything can be learned. We can always learn the skills, the tactics, the strategies in whatever field. If you left Roofing Insights, you could start another YouTube channel in a whole other space by applying all of that. But what we can't teach is clarity and direction. And if you don't have clarity and direction, guaranteed you're going to fail.